I think it's on. Yep, it's on. Um, can I move this and not cause it to collapse? I think, okay. Oh, right here? To the right? Okay, thank you. Okay, guys, I'm Tiffany. This is our last class on the Constitution. <laughs> oh, thanks, yeah. Um, on the Constitution and our rights as Christians. So let's open up in prayer and then we can begin. Oh, Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for your church, God. We thank you for the brethren. We thank you, God, that we can come here and gather and that we can just be in your presence and that uh, we just that we have the body, Lord, to um, just to walk through this narrow and afflicted path together, Lord. I just pray that you're here with us. Holy Spirit, guide and lead this teaching, God. I pray that it gives you all glory and all honor. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, so I'm sure most of you... Um, are aware of the fact that socialism has become kind of a trendy ideology lately, particularly for people under a certain age group. Um, and so the really quick, um, really quick, simple definition of what socialism is, is it's when the government is in control over and um, has all control and ownership of our um, of our market and of our economy. So instead of we the people running the economy and running the market, it's the government. So imagine what that would look like. It would basically be a society that's like the DMV, okay? So on a practical level, not exactly very effective. On a practical level, not exactly very efficient. And so, um, so just on a practical level, socialism is a bad idea. On a biblical level, it's, uh, it's also a bad idea. So regardless of what we're calling it today, whether it's democratic socialism, progressivism, the far left, whatever you want to call it, it is and always will be the demonic spirit that under pins the government prophesied in Revelations 13. It is that one unified worldly government system that is going to usher in the spirit of the Antichrist, which is why we as Christians need to firmly stand against socialism, whatever name we're giving it today, okay? So every nation that has ever fallen to socialism has always followed some variation of this pattern, okay? Number one, it's been re rewrite history. Yeah. Number two, rig elections. Number three, um, create dependency upon the government by using either fear or entitlement. Number four, imprison or silence the dissenters, i.e. the people who speak against the government. And number five, disarm the civilians. So we already see much of that happening today. We talked about that in the first class. Remember, we talked about the soft totalitarianism, the uh, mob rule, the cancel culture. So we're already starting to to be silenced if we, if we preach any ideology that goes against socialism. And so we are already descending on that slippery slope to falling to socialism. So we as a people now need to decide that we're gonna stop it before it gets to disarming the civilians, okay? Now how do we do that? Well, we have the Second Amendment, so that's what we're gonna talk about first, okay? So, the Second Amendment is a very, very misunderstood amendment. It's misunderstood by both the pro-Second Amendment and the anti-Second Amendment. So, I'm going to explain what it means. If you could put up the Second Amendment slide, please. So, let's just read it first. Um, it states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So what does that mean? Well, the Second Amendment actually has been interpreted into two separate parts. And so the first part is called the prefatory phrase, and I'll explain what that means um, in a bit. But the first part, if you could just put up the, the prefatory phrase, prefatory phrase. Um, so the courts have just taken that beginning part of the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The courts have taken that clause and have said that the right to bear arms does not belong to you, the individuals. The right to bear arms belongs to the state. And so what that means is because remember, when the Constitution was written back in 1780. Nine, when the Constitution was written, it was written to create the federal government and was written to create the federal military. We talked about this in the first class. And so then, 
three years later, in 1791, the founding forefathers realized, well, wait a minute, the federal government could have too much power, and that's why they wrote the Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment. Well, what the state said, is this, the, through the court system, said, well, the state needs to ensure that the state has the militia, that's us, right? The militia is we the people. The state needs to make sure that it has a militia that the state can call upon should the state want to um, secede, that means get removed from the nation, should the state want to secede and become its own nation, the state needs a militia to call upon to fight against its own federal government. So contrary to what some people believe, the Second Amendment was, is not to ensure that we can hunt for food. The Second Amendment also wasn't to protect us from the British. I don't have time to get into the whole history of what happened with the peace treaties with France and, and Spain and us, but essentially by 1791, the Brits wanted nothing to do with us. And so they were like, let those crazy Americans just stay over there. And so there was zero concern about the British coming to um, invade our country. The concern was against the federal government. So the Second Amendment exists so that we can fight against the federal government should the federal government become too tyrannical. But the state, the right belongs to the state, not us. So what does that look like? So there was a case in 1939 where, um, Basically, this, there was a state that prohibited the possession of a sawed-off shotgun. And a guy was arrested for having a sawed-off shotgun. This made it all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court validated that law and upheld his arrest and found that, yes, this right to possess a firearm belongs to the state. So the state can say, you can't possess a sawed-off shotgun. What was the reasoning for it? Well, let's read that. Could you put the Miller case up, please? So the Miller case states... Um, now, this was back in 1939, okay? So the Miller case states, in the absence of any evidence tending to show that possession or use of a sawed-off shotgun has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument. What does that mean? Bottom line means, if it can't be used for military purposes, you can't possess it. So back in 1939, the standard for your right to bear arms was you can't have a firearm unless it's military grade. So when I first, <laughs> so when I first, <laughs> when I first told my husband about that case, he was like, okay, Pete Buttigieg, you can have my nine millimeter, but you're not taking my rocket launcher. And so we're joking, joking, internet, we don't have a rocket launcher. But so how did we get so far from that? Because we don't possess military grade firearms firearms, as far as I know, nobody here has that, right? How did we get so far from that? Well, remember, the reason the state said Miller could only have a military-grade firearm is because the state said, Miller, your right to possess a firearm is contingent upon us, the state, needing you to be our militia. So as the need for a militia started to pretty much disappear, because why? We have the National Guard that represents each state, right? And the threat of the federal government becoming tyrannical has gone. It seems like the farther away we got from the Revolutionary War, the farther away we got from wanting to uphold our freedoms. And um, no state really talks about seceding anymore, not even Texas, right? And so, <laughs> and so here we are, a united nation with zero threat of needing a militia. And so the state has, because of this case, saying that the right belongs to the state, not you guys. That is how we have ushered in all of these regulations regarding possession, sale, and transfer of a firearm, okay? So is that where we are today, where the right belongs to the state? No, that's not where we are today. And we have my favorite Supreme Court Justice, Justice Scalia, to thank for, for this. And so... Justice Scalia, who, um, the reason, even before I got saved, he was my favorite justice because he reads the Constitution the way we should read our Bibles. Do exactly what it says. Yeah. And don't do exactly what it says not to do. And so, Justice Scalia, there was this case in 2008, so believe it or not, the right to bear arms belonged to the state up until 2008. And so that's why we have all these gun regulations, right? And so in 2008, um, so the District of Columbia had an, a complete and total outright ban of all handguns. And so, um, and any other firearm, so like a rifle or a shotgun, it had to be um, unloaded and disassembled at all times, unless you were gonna effectively use it. And so rendering it completely useless, right? And so this guy sued the state, I can't remember his name, but he sued the state, Heller. 
hence the name of the case. And so this guy sued the state and said, wait a minute, I have a right to bear arms. You can't tell me I can't have a handgun. And the court, thanks to Justice Scalia, said, you're right. They can't tell you you don't have a handgun. And so um, what Heller did is it shifted the right from belonging to the state to now the right belongs to the individual. And so let's read the Heller opinion, if you could put that up, please. Um, do I have that in this book? Yes. OK, so in Heller, uh, the court wrote, the right to bear arms has always been the distinctive privilege of free men. The inherent right to self-defense has been central to the Second Amendment right, and the home is where the need for defense of self, family, and property is most acute. And so what the court found then is, is our, us being sovereign men, able to govern ourselves, so sovereign from the government, of course, not sovereign from the Lord, that inherently gives us the right to defend our home, to defend our family, and to defend our property. And inherent is in that is the right to bear arms. So unfortunately, though, um, because of precedent, precedent is when a court rules a certain way, and then that establishes that that now is the way that all the courts need to rule. Because of the precedent of uh, regulating the transfer and the, the sale, we still have a lot of those laws existing today. The way the Second Amendment is treated is basically, if you guys were here last week when we talked about the free exercise of religion, and we talked about how, yes, the, the government can't infringe upon your exercise of religion, they can't infringe upon your belief in Jesus Christ, your worship of him, but they can infringe upon the manner in which you worship him. Remember that last week? That's where what the Second Amendment has been reduced to. So they can't, they can't infringe upon your right to bear arms, but they can and do infringe upon the sale and the transfer and things of that sort. So. Um, why am I talking about Second Amendment? Because remember, we have already begun the descent to potentially falling to socialism, and every country that has fallen to socialism or communism has lost its right to bear arms. And so we need to stop at that point before that happens. Um, and for people who might be, you know, and so, so as a people, even if you personally don't care to own a firearm or possess a firearm or have one in your, your home, that's t absolutely your right. But as a people, we need to agree that we're not going to support legislation that infringes upon other people's right to possess firearms. And if you happen to be somebody who does support that legislation, um, I would encourage you to just reflect on this statement. An armed man is a citizen of a free state. An unarmed man is a subject of a dictatorship. Okay, so that's our second amendment. So, okay. We're moving on to um, the 14th Amendment, which like, ah, I could spend like a year on this. And so I'm going to try and not talk so fast, but we have so much to cover. So the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868. So what happened right before 1868, right? We had our Civil War. We had our Civil War from 1861 to 1865. And so the 14th Amendment was written to stop the states from discriminating against the recently freed African-American slaves. And it wasn't just that, we also had a massive um, immigration from Asia, particularly China, because the railroad started um, developing, and so, so a lot of people from, from Asia and Southeast Asia were coming, and then we had the Native Americans who had already been here from the beginning, right? And so we just had a lot of racial minorities who were not being protected, by, uh, who, the laws were not applied to them in the same way they were applied to the Europeans who were here. And so the 14th Amendment was absolutely necessary. It was absolutely necessary. And so that brings us to the title of this class. If you could put up that title, please. The title of this class is The Lord is Maker of Them All. That comes from Proverbs 22. And so the biblical principle that the Lord is the maker of them all also, the biblical principle that, the, that, the, that, that God created all of us equally in his image, right? We're not all children of God. You don't become his child unless you're adopted in by the blood of Jesus. But we are all his creation and we are made equally in his image. Those biblical principles, I believe, are captured in the 14th Amendment. Okay, so let's read the 14th Amendment, please. Um, it's like way longer than this, but I'm just taking the beginning part. And so um, the 14th Amendment, I know it's up there, but I like books. Okay, so all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. That basically just means if you're born here, you're a citizen. No state shall make or enforce any laws which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. So what that means is the Constitution needs to apply to all 50 states. Then we have, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, 
liberty or property without due process of law. That's called the due process clause. We're going to talk about that in just a second. <clears throat> nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. That's called the Equal Protection Clause, and we're going to talk about that. So notice here what the 14th Amendment says. It says all persons, any person, any person, three times. Okay. So to me, that mirrors the biblical principle of we are, the God is maker of them all. We are all created in his image. And so it is all persons. The, the, the laws should apply to each and every single one of us equally. That is not what the 14th Amendment guarantees any longer. The law in no way, shape, or form applies to each of us equally. And we're going to pause on that for a second and get into that in a little bit. But first, we're going to elaborate a little bit more specifically on due process. So if you could just put up um, the due process clause, please. So the state cannot deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Due process of law means fundament fundamental fairness in the judicial process. So it's what we know as our day in court, okay? So the state can deprive you, they just can't deprive you without your day in court, okay? But it's deprive you of what? Just life, liberty, and property. Those are the three things that are protected. What about privacy? Raise your hand if you've ever heard that we have a fundamental right to privacy, that we have a constitutional right to privacy. Nobody's heard that? Okay, a couple people, some, okay. So, so where does it say that in the Constitution? What, what, where in the Constitution is it declared that we have a right to privacy? I see people shaking their heads. Nowhere, it's absolutely nowhere. We have nowhere in the Constitution, no, nowhere in our Bill of Rights, nowhere in any of our founding documents, the, the Declaration of Independence, the Federalist Papers, the entire Constitution, the Bill of Rights, nowhere is there a right to privacy. Why do we now have a right to privacy? I'll tell you why. Because the courts have, have exceeded their authority and have um, exercised an abuse of powers and created a right that never existed in, in the Constitution to begin with. Remember last week, we talked about how there are three branches of government, judicial, executive, legislative, and each one has its own function, each one has its own role, so that we have the checks and balances and so that we have the separation of powers because our constitution was written so that not one person nor one entity could have too much power, right? So the Supreme Court, its rule, its role is to interpret the constitutionality of laws. Legislature's role is to create laws, okay? And so what happened here, um, this case that created the right to privacy, it is, in my opinion, absolutely the worst ruling in the history of our country, and it's also one of the most wicked and evil rulings in the history of our country. Now, uh, um, and, so, and so to be sure, there absolutely were wicked rulings regarding segregation and regarding um, slavery, but all of those cases have been overturned, okay? This case has not been overturned. This case is still considered the law of the land, this, and, and I'm, I'm going to explain to you why I think it's wicked. So what happened in Connecticut, this was in 1965, is there was a law that prohibited the use of medicinal contraception, and so any medicine that's used for contraception or any medicinal de medical device, any medical device that's used for contraception, that was completely prohibited. And so there was a married couple who sued because they wanted to use contraception and they were prohibited. So like, for sure, that's a really dumb law. Absolutely, absolutely. But because a married couple should certainly have a right based on how the Lord guides them, a right to contraception. But if you have a problem with a law, you take it up with legislature. That's our checks and balance. That's our separation of powers. You have a problem with a law, you gather the signatures, you get that law repealed, or you want a law to go forward, you gather the signatures, you get the law on a ballot, right? This is how our system is supposed to work so we don't have tyranny. What's not supposed to happen is the Supreme Court, because it's power tripping and because it wants to take on the role of legislature, the Supreme Court can't just create laws that don't exist. And so what did the court rule in Griswold? The court ruled, um, if you could put up the Griswold case, please. The court ruled, <clears throat> The concept of liberty protects those personal rights that are fundamental and is not confined to the specific terms of the Bill of Rights. My conclusion that the concept of liberty embraces the right of marital privacy, though the right is not mentioned explicitly in the Constitution, is supported by numerous decisions of this court. No, it's not. And so, basically, what the justice of the Supreme Court even admitted is, yeah, this doesn't exist in the Constitution. There is no right to privacy in the Constitution. But I don't like this law. And so, because I don't like this law, I'm going to create a right that doesn't exist, and I'm going to say that this law violates this right, because the Supreme Court does have the authority 
to determine whether a law violates the Constitution. And so what he did is he created a term in the Constitution that never previously existed just because he didn't like that law. Why do I hate this case so much? And it's okay to hate something. We are supposed to hate what God, what goes against God. Why do I hate this case? Because this case is what led to Roe v. Wade. And Roe v. Wade, I'm sure everybody knows, is the case that legalized abortion across our entire nation. So this case led to the murdering of 60 million babies. This led case to now, led to now we have states in our union that are passing legislation allowing for late-term abortion. We have in this state, in this country, basically this, this ideology that you're entitled to abortion on demand. This has all happened because of Griswold versus Connecticut. Because in Griswold, the state created a right to privacy privacy that never existed and doesn't exist in the Constitution, then decided contraception falls into that right. And so then, 15, 10 years later, Roe v. Wade then looked at that case in Griswold and said, well, we've already established that there's a right to privacy. We've already established that contraception is included in that right to privacy. So now, abortion is contraception protected as a right to privacy. That's why this case is so wicked. And so what does this have to do with us as Christians and our rights under the Constitution? It has absolutely nothing to do with us as Christians and our rights under the Constitution. But it has everything to do with the rights of the unborn child. And it has everything to do with our duties as Christians to stand against it. I am so sick and tired of seeing people who identify as Christ followers saying cowardly, horribly cowardly things like, well, I personally would never have an abortion, but I'm not going to infringe upon your right to do it. First of all, it's not a right, okay? Legally, it's not a right. This, this privacy was literally just created by four, five justices of the Supreme Court, okay? So number one, legally, it's not a right. And number two, biblically, you are supposed to flee from sin. You are supposed to abhor evil. Abhor evil does not mean, well, I personally wouldn't do it, but I'm not going to infringe upon her right. Abhor evil means that you boldly declare that abortion is murder and that we are not going to stand for it, okay? Now, for anybody who... And so I do, I do want to just say, if, if for anybody, any woman listening or who might listen to this, if anybody has ever had an abortion, God is so merciful to forgive. All you need to do is turn to him and repent, Amen. truly, truly repent. And he, the Bible says that he is faithful to forgive you and he will cast his, your sins out as far as the east is to the west and remember them no more. Okay. So I'm not talking to the people who have had the abortion, just repent and the God will, is quick to heal you. I'm talking about the Christians who refuse to stand against it. So uh, the last, I do want to, oh, I don't have time to do that. Okay, so um, let's, uh, so that's due process. Um, equal protection. Okay, so. Um, uh, Okay, so we're going to talk about equal protection. Let's just start by reading it. Um, if you could pull up the equal protection clause, please. Um, so equal protection, remember, this is still a part of the 14th Amendment, right? Um, so equal protection is that no state shall deny any person, so there it is again, right? Any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And so what that should mean, like maybe I'm dumb, but when I read any person, I think that literally means any person, right? And so, but that is absolutely not how the courts have interpreted it now. Um, so whether you get protection under the 14th Amendment, that depends on what classification you fall under, okay? So I'm gonna explain what the classification thing first. So let's take me, okay? So I'm a female. Um, I am of Asian and Hispanic descent. My family immigrated here when I was three years old. I became a citizen when I was 15, and I'm a Christian. So those are five classifications, okay? My husband, he is a male. He, um, his family immigrated here, I don't know, probably like 150 years ago or something like that. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's white, and he's, uh, he's what else? Um, he's a Christian. And so there's four, four classifications. And so, um, oh, he was born a citizen, okay? So five, we each have five classifications, one in common, the other four are different, right? So the courts now look at those classifications and decide what type of protection you get based on those classifications, okay? And so the first thing that, that, I, that I wanna say about that is that we need to remember that we are Christians before anything else, okay? Your identity is in Christ and is in Christ alone. You were bought with a price and you belong to Jesus. So, like, we need to not have our identity based on these classifications that's created by government, okay? And so, um, 
I don't have time to get into what all of the classifications are, but remember when we talked about the public forums and how whether your free speech rights are protected, it depends on what forum you, you fall in, that's exactly what the classifications are now. You've got three different levels of protection based on what your classification is, okay? So could you please just put up the strict scrutiny one? So the most protection that you get is if you fall under this classification of strict scrutiny. So that means that if the government passes a law that um, violates your equal protection, so basically, basically, this is how it happens. If you, um, if there's a law in your state, and that law applies to you differently than it applies to your neighbor, whether it's you, a business owner, you as an individual, or you as a church, if the law is applying to you differently than your neighbor, you can sue the state. But the first thing the court is going to ask is, well, what classification do you fall under? And only if you fall under this classification um, do you get that heightened level of protection, which is called strict scrutiny. And so who falls under that classification? The people who fall under that classification are the people who've been put in the category of suspect class. Suspect class is defined as you historically have been at a disadvantage, and so you are entitled to this greater protection. Who is the suspect class? It's just race and it's just gender. That's it. So notice I didn't say religion. I didn't say Christian. And the courts have actually ruled that Christians are not protected class under this because, because we have not been disadvantaged historically. So I would beg to differ, and clearly they don't read their Bibles, but whatever. And so, <laughs> so why do I hate these classifications so much, right? Because the truth is there are racial minorities who have been historically disadvantaged over others, right? Absolutely. The truth is the female gender has been at a disadvantage historically, more so than the male. These things are true, but why do I hate these classifications? Because the government cannot have authority to decide what our classifications are and put us into categories based on those classifications. And the government can't say, you only get these 14th Amendment protections if you fall into that classification. That's what Nazi Germany did. Yeah. And we're supposed to be above that, but, we're, but we're, we're putting people in classifications based on the government's deciding what you fall under and you only get protection if you fall under that correct classification. And so um, the, that's number one why I don't like the classifications. Number two why I don't like the classifications is because in 2015, when the case went down, I can't remember what it's called, but the case that legalized gay marriage across our entire nation. So since then, there's been a lot of talk about including sexual orientation into those classifications. And I guarantee you, once sexual orientation is in that classification, so will gender identity. And so remember, those people in that category they're the ones, they're the only ones who get that heightened level of protection, nobody else. And so what does that mean for us as Christians? As soon as sexual orientation and gender identity are in that protected class, then our speech, if you remember back in the first class, our speech of marriages between a man and a woman, our speech of there are only two genders, that is going to be considered harassment, going to be considered fighting words, if you remember that from the first class. And so we're the ones who are going to be at, under attack based on these classifications. So that's the second reason why I dislike them so much. Um, is that making sense, guys? Um, okay, so I just said religion's not protected under the 14th Amendment. Perhaps some of you have been thinking, well, wait a minute, how come I always hear that my employer can't discriminate against me based on my religion? That is correct, but that's not doesn't come from the 14th Amendment, okay? The 14th Amendment deals with the government and the individual. So what can the government do? What laws can the government pass that affect us? The Civil Rights Act of 1964 deals with the individual and the individual. What can an employer do for an, to an employee? What can a business owner do for a customer? And that's where we do have religious protection, okay? So the, 19, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that act uh, was created to um, prohibit discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. So now we have five in that category. Under the 14th Amendment, the category is called suspect class. Under the Civil Rights Act, it's called protected class. But essentially, it's the same thing. You only get that protection if you fall into that category. And so now the category is broader. It's race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. So we're included in that, right? Um, uh, and so um, I'm just going to talk about two. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is so long. I'm just going to talk about two specific portions of it. The first one is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. If you could put that act up, please. Um, and so the EEOC, that's where we're entitled to reasonable accommodation in our workplace. Okay. So what that means is that if you have a religious practice or religious belief, uh, your employer is required to reasonably accommodate that. But... 
only if it does not um, cause more than a minimum burden to the employer. So minimum burden, minimal, minimal burden, that's not very high standard. It's not, that's a low standard. And so the minimal burden, there is lots of case law that has already come down that says that your employer is not required to, to give you Sunday off. He's not required to honor the Sabbath. And so if your employer honors the Sabbath for other religions or makes accommodations for other religions, then he has to accommodate you as well. But employers obviously get around that by just not doing any accommodations, right? And so, um, but if, if, if you requesting Sunday off is going to cause more than minimal burden, then he is not required to provide that for you. So am I saying don't ask for Sunday off? Absolutely not. What I am saying is work heartedly unto the Lord. If you go to work and if you have a strong work ethic, if you glorify God in your work, if, you, if, you're, if you're just like a really good employee and your boss can count on you and then you pray and you ask the Lord to open that door for you, I'm sure the Lord is going to bless that path. But if you go into work and you don't honor God with how you work, you're always late, you're grumbling and complaining, you only do the bare minimum. First of all, you're not honoring God in your work. And then second of all, your employer is not going to be, is not going to want to accommodate your request, particularly since he knows he doesn't have to, okay? So just work heartily unto the Lord, and I, I, I'm sure God will bless that path for you to have Sunday off. So the next part is um, the public accommodations. This part... Um, Public accommodation is like, um, it's a public place that offers a good or a service. So like a hair salon is a service, right? And then selling cars is a good, right? And so um, basically you are entitled to not be discriminated against. Um, but I wanted, this is, a, so, so can we put up the public accommodation? Okay, so, so here again, race, color, religion, national origin. Washington has adopted this statute, but Washington has added sexual orientation to the list since 1996. Okay, the feds don't have it, but we do in Washington state. And so this is the other reason that I don't like the classifications. It's because what happens then if there are competing interests? So this is the most protected group of people, right? So what happens if it's some somebody in race, that category, and then somebody in the sexual orientation category, who wins? So that's the exact reason why we shouldn't have, that's the third reason now why we shouldn't have the classifications. The government shouldn't be able to even decide that, right? What happened to all persons? What happened to any person? What happened to that? And so... The public accommodations, um, this is the case in Washington State, I'm sure most of you have heard about it, but it was the woman who owned the florist in, I think, Richland, and then she didn't do um, the flowers for a gay wedding, okay? Now, what happened was her argument was, remember when we talked about the flag burning case and how that conduct is considered speech, and the, the standard was, is it inherently expressive? If what your conduct is inherently expresses a viewpoint, then that's considered speech and it's protected. And so what she said is she said, I, ca I can't do this gay wedding because that's not just a good and it's not just a service. It's me coming together and and collaborating with the groom and the groom and and creating the, the centerpieces and creating the, the bouquets. And that's, she's saying that that's her artistic expression and that do her doing that for a gay wedding would be inherently expressive that she supports that gay wedding, which totally makes sense to me, right? Well, the court rejected her argument and the court ruled against her. And this went all the way up to the Washington State Supreme Court. And so if you could put the Arlene case up. And so the court ruled um, that, the, that the decision to either provide or refuse to provide flowers for a wedding does not inherently express a message about that wedding. Therefore, it is unprotected conduct. So essentially what the court ruled is that's not speech. That's just, that's just conduct and your conduct isn't protected. And so here is an example of that. So we have one category, sexual orientation, that's protected in our state, and then the, under the Civil Rights Act, and then the other category, religion, that's protected in our state under the Civil Rights Act, but now, the, but they have competing interests, and so the court decided that the right, that the sexual orientation classification has takes priority over the um, religion right. And so, this, guys, is the result of progressivism. This is exactly that. Progressivism has resulted in these new classifications created, and this is why this case infuriates me, because the sexual orientation as a protected class, that didn't begin until 1996. Yet the right to free speech and the right to religious exercise, that predates the birth of our nation. Yeah. And yet the right that predates the birth of our nation has now taken a back seat to a right that has just now been created by the courts because of these classifications that they've created. And so we've gone very far from the Lord is maker of them all. We've gone very far from we are all made in the image of God. And we've gone very from, far from what our constitution even says, which is um, all persons, any persons. It's no longer any persons. It's if you fall into the classification that the court deems is worthy of being protected. 
And so uh, where does that leave us now? Well, my prayer throughout this whole thing um, has been that the Lord, that this gives God glory and that this, this class honors God by opening the eyes of his people, that, that, the, that his people's eyes are opened to the persecution that's coming to, and to the affliction that's coming and that we get emboldened in Christ to prepare. We need to prepare our minds. We need to prepare our hearts. We need to prepare our homes and we need to prepare our church to suffer affliction with the brethren and to walk through the fiery furnace proclaiming the gospel the whole entire time. I hope you see how significantly under attack our religious liberties have been specifically over the last 70 years and it's just going to get worse. It's going to get worse and we need to be prepared as the body of Christ to be able to endure faithfully and to be able to to fight the good fight until the very end. And so I'm just going to leave with um, a, a quote from Scalia. Um, he was speaking to, um, he was speaking at like a conference seminar type thing, and he was speaking to a room full of Christians, like hundreds of Christians. And what he said to those Christians is this. And so this is my heart behind the last three weeks, and he says it better than I could. So if I have brought any message today, it is this. Okay, this is going to make me cry. Have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity. We are fools for Christ's sake. We must pray for the courage to endure the scorn of the modern world. Yeah. 